In 2009, Lisa founded Strategies for Youth, which is a nonprofit advocacy and training organization dedicated to improving police youth interactions and reducing disproportionate minority contact. Prior to forming Strategies for Youth, from 1999 to 2008, Lisa served as a policy specialist and then as managing director of the Juvenile Justice Center of Suffolk Lake Law School. There, Lisa focused on public policy advocacy on behalf of court-involved teens. She monitored juvenile civil rights issues regarding police treatment, tracked trends in the center's cases, and also monitored and challenged legislation affecting youth in the juvenile justice system. She's a graduate of a Barnard College and holds a master's degree in anthropology from Columbia University. She graduated from the Benjamin and Cardozo School of Law at Yeshiva, Yeshiva um, University in 1991. And before becoming an attorney, Lisa worked as a researcher and advocate for reform and improvement of the public education system in New York City. So I'll turn it over to Lisa. So, um, I'll stop interrupting myself by just speaking the whole time. All right. So, anyone online having this kind of day, or did anyone come here today to avoid this kind of day, working at home and taking care of your children? Does this seem uh, familiar to anyone? Okay, I want to ask you to ident your, identify yourself, but um, we're going to talk about a concept called strain, and to me, this personifies it trying to do many things at once, please many people at once, and stop ear-piercing shrieking while you're on the phone for work. Is that a similar, you know, sound familiar? Okay. Well, as we talk about risk factor and protective factors, COVID is such a perfect example of not knowing how an intervention uh, can be uh, something that increases or decreases a risk factor or actually provides a protective factor in kids' lives, right? So maybe you close the schools, uh, but that may put kids at home with parents uh, having these issues, and that may be a risk factor. Or maybe you open schools, and that may put kids at risk of catching COVID, and it's just hard to know what to do. Um, I say this because it's important to come at all of this with humility and understand that it's hard to make the right decision at times. And I say this also because um, when we talk about risk and protective factors with kids, it's important to recognize how a lot of their choices are equally difficult. As a school administrator right now, I would be taking a lot of Valium. I would not know what the right thing to do is because the choices seem bad on both ends. Um, I'm not saying Valium is the only thing I'd take, it's just one of the things. But it is a hard job, right? And so often, so many of our kids are making what feels to them like very difficult choices. And I think Jessica just said it so beautifully when she made that example of lying. By the way, we, we train all over. We have about nine psychologists who work with us, and Jessica's treatment of trauma is the best of our nine, so thank you again. Um, oops, oh, there we go, sorry. Um, today, I want to talk about risk factors and protective factors in terms of understanding strain. In your packet, you'll see um, three scenarios, one involving Jarrell, one involving Emma, and one involving um, um, Devin. And um, later on, you can think about this PowerPoint presentation and imagine um, how you would identify their strains and what they're most likely to get in trouble for, system involved for, which are questions posed below. But if we look at strain theory, which was an old theory created in the 1930s by Robert K. Merton, it's basically um, the, a produ production of emotional responses to an inability to achieve a positive goal, like get through a conversation with your boss, or the threat of loss of some positive stimuli, or the threat of it being negative, so abuse or humiliation. And when we see, this is, this is engineering, uh, when we see stress happening, we see a lot of things and people crack. 
And that's actually the term we use when we talk about it. And you see how too much stress can warp even metal. I uh, used to work at a law firm for 730 days, a, a corporate law firm in New York. And I would watch how stress would just completely change personalities to um, a certain point where people could not go back to being normal. They were just too stressed. So um, it's interesting uh, to think about that in this situation, perhaps. This may be a bit too loud. Tell me what the stresses are in this fellow's life. So, how did it be all? Chemistry. It is the study of change. It is growth, then decay, then transformation. We love you, man. We love you. Everybody, the wall! You understood what I've just said to you? Yes. Lung cancer. Inoperable. A substantial amount of methamphetamine being taken off the streets. Hank, how much money is that? Uh, it's about 700 grand. It's easy money. Why don't you say the word and uh, I'll take you on a ride? Oh, I just knocked down a meth lab. Thank you. I'm thinking that you and I could partner up. You know the business. And I know the chemistry. You want to cook crystal meth? Cooking is off. Actually, it's just basic chemistry. So straight like you just gonna break that? It's like this wild lately. Tell me why you're doing this. I am a weak miracle being something. You're comfortable about me. I just want you to know that no matter how it may work, I only have you in my heart. Run, Mr. White, run! Get a little excitement in your life. <laughs> Something. So, um, why was this television series so popular, do you think? Does it resonate with strains? that all Americans may be feeling right now? What are, what are some strains he's living in with? Financial, yep. And the financial strains got worse when he learned what? He's got cancer, right? And his, his do you think he felt humiliated to be a chemistry teacher working in a car wash? Do you think he wants to please his wife? Do you think he's competing with his brother-in-law? Do you think he feels like he can be a man in front of his son? All those are strains, right? Some more basic and some more ephemeral, but all of them are strains. And it's when there's this imbalance between what a man should be and what a man can deliver, much less when a teenager feels he should be or she should be and can deliver, uh, that you can see some deviant behavior or deviant choices because behavior is a function of perceived options. And in some places, the ability of young people, especially to perceive options, is limited. Now, will everybody under strain become deviant? No. Some may yell more than start cooking meth, um, but they will make choices that at times look incomprehensible to us. There are coping mechanisms for strain. We all have them. Um, I know that there's some healthy ones, be they jogging or whatever, but we know there's some really unhealthy ones like not eating or eating way too much or drinking um, or, or uh, you know, smoking pot and hanging out with people who uh, give you a high and a rise and make you feel good um, until they don't. And we also know that as a part of adolescent development, it's very important to save space and say, no, I'm not stressed. Life is not hectic. I can handle all this. And underneath that fake exterior, there is an iceberg worth of stress and anxiety and uncertainty. So if we think, and are any of you folks here police officers? 
because this is a, a term used by police a lot, OODA loops. Um, I thought it was a new kind of serial, but it means to observe, to orient, to decide, and then act. You can see that sometimes those choices for kids with a very limited perception of what their options are and no adult to guide them and stress is coming down on them can lead to some very unfortunate decisions and actions. So let me give you an example. Um, you, sir, um, in, the, in the white jacket there, if I told you, and you lived on, on the right side of this uh, fence here, to go swimming every day, um, would that be a problem? No. Why not? What would you do? What would you do? What would you do if I told you to go swimming every day? Where would you do it? Which is near where? It's right on your porch, right? On the patio outside of your apartment. OK. Um, Suzanne, if you lived on the other side of that fence, and I said, I want you to play tennis every day. If you don't play tennis every day, I'm going to fail you in your school. What would you do to get that goal of not failing to pass school if you were told you had to play tennis every day? Uh huh. And some of you wouldn't break the law. Some of you would say, well, I'd rather fail school than break the law and get involved in that system, right? But for many kids, some of the situations presented to them seem as hard to navigate. And so if we're going to perceive things from their world's view, understanding what they perceive to be options is, is really key, and what they perceive are options, and why certain things don't even look like options. So when we look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which we keep re bringing up uh, because they're key here, we know that kids um, who have less on the physiological and safety um, support systems are more likely to make impulsive and reactive decisions and choices because the number of risk factors in their life, the, the re repetition level of the refrain of the Jaws music, for instance, is another scale, I'm sure it's scientific, um, is so much higher. Um, I don't know if any of you have had adopted children from countries where the orphanages didn't feed the children right, but what's the first thing kids will do, like from a Russian or Romanian orphanage sometimes, if you put out food on the table. Anyone ever see this? They'll stick all the food they can in their mouth. Is that because they're thieves? No, this is a survival mechanism to, um, to get through and to protect themselves because someone failed on level one and level two. And what does food become in a situation like that? Well, maybe it becomes a manifestation of love or family because it is filling their needs. Unfortunately, when those two bottom pieces aren't dealt with, a lot of other strains that would be, let's say, refutable or able to be resisted become overwhelming to many kids. And if you compound that with a lack of family support or those adults who can navigate and buffer things, you're, you're really putting things in even greater stress. So Jessica, Jessica before uh, said something that will be a theme throughout this conference, I think you've heard, which is if you have an adult who can navigate, uh, they can buffer you from a lot of the harms of trauma. Um, when I was growing up, if you were to talk about trauma, you would often be told, and I don't know how many of you are my age, let's just say I'm going to be 60 soon. Um, if you talked about your trauma, you were told to shut up, right? Don't talk about that. Don't talk about that. We've changed that dramatically. But think about all the people walking around being told, don't express it, just deal with it, even by adults who are supposed to be there to take care of it. So when those two lacks of support, the lack of protective factors, are then compounded by risks or actual traumas, 
you have a lot of pressures on children who are not yet skilled to navigate it. And before we tell them they're navigating things the wrong way, we have to recognize why they're navigating that way at all, and then, as Jessica said, try and propose some replacement approaches. And that's because environment matters. And if I were to tell you, sir, is your name Rod? If I were to say to you, um, whenever you walk into a situation, I want to see that you're wearing a collared shirt, tucked in pants, a belt, and you say, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. And I would assume that that would work for you in every situation, and I would be rather wrong, right? There's a whole bunch of situations where if you're a 15-year-old boy and that's how you presented yourself, that would be harmful. Environment matters, and the skills and strategies we're teaching kids for negotiating the risk and protective factors in their lives are difficult. And a lot of them are sufficient at code switching to understand that. But environment matters. To the extent we ignore that, we do so at the kid's harm and can create ourselves as a risk factor. So it, I've gone to places where I've mentioned this idea that environment matters and was told I'm wrong, um, that kids you know, grow up, they're bad seeds, good seeds. Um, they, many of the people who I've trained have said, well, I grew up in a bad environment and I came out fine. Um, that kind of thinking isn't going to work anymore. Um, and, and here's my uh, perfect example of it. When your cable's on the fritz, you get frustrated. When you get frustrated, your daughter imitates. When your daughter imitates, she gets thrown out of school. When she gets thrown out of school, she meets undesirables. When she meets undesirables, she ties the knot with undesirables. And when she ties the knot with undesirables, you get a grandson with a dog collar. Don't have a grandson with a dog collar. OK, so now I've persuaded you, right? Environment matters. All right, well, when you consider how environment matters and that developmentally during adolescence, the years when we're dealing with a lot of kids who are system involved, rewards are what they're fine tuned to. Um, and when they're being told who and what matters and basically being shaped into this procrastinating bed of acceptable uh, skills and abilities and um, personality figures, you are going to see that some of them are making choices that re reflect their need for a reward, reflect their need of perceived options, and a manifestation of their risks and the risk factors they have seen. So when we typically do this training, uh, we bring all these topics into uh, play here because they all help explain some of the risk and protective factors kids have. The government po poverty guidelines um, show you how much families that are not employed or not somehow connected to employment are being supported with government support. So at 100% of the family guide um, poverty level, a family of three, let's say a mom and two kids, are living on $21,720. I don't know how that's done. Um, I, I would like to learn, I think. But um, you already are setting such a frame of stress with such a paucity of resources that that's the first thing that is uh, going to trigger the Jaws music in a kid's head, this anxiety about there being enough. In the United States, the average is about 15% of youth living in poverty. In Nebraska, it's about 14%. In Omaha, there are parts that are 21%. Anybody um, believe that there's one level across the, the, the state here? Or can you see that even in your counties, there are pockets where it's much higher than what the state average is? Do you all see that? I know just with teen pregnancy, for instance, which is not far from being associated with some of this data, that where I live, there's six uh, teen pregnancies per 1,000 15 to 19 year olds. Three miles from where I live in Chelsea, there are 82 per 1,000 15 to 19 year olds. So uh, environment matters. The wage distribution in Lincoln, which I took as an example, shows that most people are earning uh, the most between the age of, um, let's say, uh, 
20 and about, um, I'm sorry, they're earning between 20,000 and 60,000 in Nebraska, which in some places is much higher than other parts of the United States. But let's look at the age and gender in Lincoln. And what you see here is 18 to 24 year olds um, are, are kids who didn't go to college and our kids who did are by far the highest uh, and most likely to be living poorly. Um, but then you also see that the age 25 to about 54, which is predominantly um, the time when people are having children or raising them, uh, women are in the most poverty-stricken uh, sectors of that chart. So you could say, where does the money go? Well, um, it, it's hard to understand where the money wouldn't go. One of the things you see constantly happening with poverty is isolation and um, a level of risk because of it. So the first thing to go would be um, the parents are often unable to um, parent together. And that's often a reflection of economic stresses. So the vast majority of single parents in America right now are women. Many fewer than, uh, than that are dads. Um, and a lot of parents uh, are so frustrated when their provider approach, which is, I'm getting you everything you need. I didn't even have that as a, as a kid. Or, you know, I got you food. I got you sneakers. I have a roof over your house is not sufficient for kids. And the parent who's saying, I'm here for you, I know you can succeed, I love you, um, and being that kind of support system beyond being a provider, and I'm not saying it's one or the other, but I'm saying a parent, um, a good parent can do both, is the kind of parent who is either too distracted to support their kids, or just doesn't understand parenting in the holistic way that most kids need to grow. And a year ago, we did a training of probation officers. We surveyed them beforehand. And uh, we asked them, what is the number one complaint of kids? And across the board, they said that no one listens to them, not at home, not at school, nowhere. And this often is what you see with very stressed, economically stressed parents who feel that just getting to the provider level is so demanding and exhausting, it's all they can do. Um, and when we talk about parenting, this is what we'd rather see. But it's increasingly hard when you're stressed, and let's not forget that COVID slide at the beginning, to do too much. Oh, those boys are much too much. Those boys are much too much. We got the spirit. We're hot. We can't be stopped. We got the spirit. We're hot. We can't be stopped. We're going to beat them and bust them. The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. So, how many of you are dealing with parents who are cheerleaders? The vast majority of the parents you encounter are cheerleaders for the kids? No, right? How many of them are just beat down? had kids before they were ready, are doing it on salaries that are insufficient, do not have networks of support, and cannot be there for their kids in the way they need. The vast majority, right? So when we think of kids growing in those environments, um, especially with boys, we have to remember that already they are starting at a deficit in not having a parent as a cheerleader, because in my view, that's a lot of what parenting ought to be. Uh, the United States leads the world in, or the developed nations, in fatherless families. And so uh, whenever we train police, we say, you know, you're a male model figure here. The way you use power, the way you use force is critically important as um, a way of demonstrating what an adult can look like, um, an adult male can look like. And so to the extent that we are seeing successes with mentoring programs, it's because often kids are getting the adults in their lives who they don't have otherwise. And this is, I think, a huge um, risk factor, not just because the male gender isn't showing up 
don't get me wrong, guys. I like it when you're there. Um, but it, because uh, we're losing a whole set of role models to demonstrate both commitment and support as well as how to respond in situations. Uh, there's a boys and girls video out called Bigs and Blues to persuade law enforcement to mentor. And one little boy is talking about his relationship with uh, a police officer who mentors him. And he said, he showed me how to mow a lawn. He showed me how to go fish. And he said, it gave me confidence to try things. It gave me confidence. And I think a lot of us see kids acting with false bravado because they lack that confidence that only comes with being told you're valuable, you're cherished. I'm going to show you how to do things. I want to see the best for you. This becomes especially clear when we look at the drop-off rates in parental engagement. So everybody's there for their kids till about sixth grade, at which point, as kids are starting to hit age 12 or 13, they really do not want to be seen anywhere with you. At that point, they all want to appear sweet, generous. You know, like, I was, I was born, I just got here at 12, I don't have parents. Um, and if you see that woman over there, that's not really my mother who's come to pick me up from school today. That is, I'm cool, I can, I can get to school by myself, right? Um, well, unfortunately, at 12, you want them to be independent, but this is also the age at which they're starting to make a lot of decisions independently, influenced by a peer group, which is influenced by a whole set of cultural exposures that is not always in the kid's interest, and that parents, when they start taking a step away, uh, lose even more control of. And so it's not surprising that the more kids are raised with fewer adults, the more likely they are to be victimized. So how about you, sir? Um, if your daughter, do you, can you pretend you have a daughter? OK. So if your daughter uh, gets threatened or hit by another kid um, on her way home from school, what can she expect you to do? Huh? Or maybe talk to the, the kid who threatened her as parents? OK. Um, well, what if you're a single dad, and you're working one job, and you've got two other children? It may not be the first priority, right, because you're overwhelmed. And I think that's how it's important to understand this. A friend of mine who did education advocacy said, you know, some parents are like, OK, the first dent in my car I'll fix. By the time it's the 10th den, it's like you throw up your hands. I'm just so out of control and overwhelmed um, that I cannot intervene sufficiently to be the protective factor I need to be for my kid. Another source of the spillover effect of poverty, um, and I think we're going to see this increasingly, especially during and post-COVID, is transportation. Public transit is key, but public transit has really lost a lot of its income during COVID and even before it. And the isolation that comes with lack of transportation is a really dangerous but enduring manifestation of some of the risk factors that come from poverty. Only when we can get them. You, we can't always get disaggregated data. Food insecurity often results from lack of transportation. Um, I don't know if any of you are, have studied food deserts in the United States, but in urban areas, it's really dramatic. Um, we see this all over, and you see one of the responses is dollar stores or do dollar general stores, which sell um, inexpensive food that is especially good for helping you bulk up, and I don't mean um, muscles. So um, this is um, a, an example of a county in Georgia. I, I, um, I'm sorry, I thought it was Lincoln County, but Georgia, where about out of 150,000 um, people, with about 50,000 kids, 23% can't get enough food to be food secure. I don't know if any of you are seeing uh, folks who depend on food stamps and have to uh, padlock their refrigerators, re refrigerators to make sure the food gets through the month. This is a risk factor. And it's important to know that hunger is um, not just a, a lack of sugar which I was hoping it was, because then I could justify eating more of it. It's, it also has a really set of strong impacts on your, how your brain works. 
don't know why it's not working here. But I, I can uh, tell you that one of the most disturbing aspects of, um, of being hangry is that it actually triggers your brain to release a hormone that then tends to make you overreact, which we used to think was uh, just being angry because you hadn't eaten. But it's actually the brain triggering what you could almost call survival hormone, saying you need to eat, find it, find it. And when you cannot answer that, um, the, the uh, problems <laughs> and the behaviors that result from it are large. Now, you live in and have created the breadbasket of the United States in Nebraska in many ways, between your wheat and soybean and corn, and uh, yet there is a lot of hunger in pockets of this country. And I was very glad to hear from Greg Gonzalez before about all these nice cars even lining up next to food banks. Um, I live in Massachusetts and in Connecticut, which is the richest state in the country, I believe. Um, the number of demands from food banks tripled uh, since 2008 when the housing crashes hit. I'll make sure you get a copy of this video because it's worth watching how this affects your brain and how it affects just everybody, not just kids. The other aspect about poverty, and I don't know if any of you read the book Evicted, um, by Matt Desmond is what it does to um, insecurity of where you live. Now, um, I think many of us think of moving as one of the worst aspects of adulthood. Imagine it, though, as a child. Uh, you, you have to keep changing. You aren't sure where you're going back to. And then socially, what does that do? So, ma'am, um, with the red um, mask here, let's say you were living in um, North Omaha, and suddenly the only place your mom could find an apartment was South Omaha, and you have to go to a new school. What are the issues that confront you? So you said transportation and not knowing anybody. When you don't know anybody, are other kids always welcoming a newcomer into a school situation? No, they're not always. So what happens? What's the first thing that often happens when there's residential mobility? Nobody talking, no one giving directions. All right, I'm from the East, they're a lot more violent. You'd get beaten up, right? The first thing would be to test you and see which group you're gonna be part of, right? And then you become system involved because of what? Because your mom moved and you have to go into another environment again and you had to protect yourself. The other thing is these frequent residential mobility, I'm not even talking about homelessness, okay? Uh, it leads to very clearly measured impacts on kids' ability to develop a vocabulary. And that affects their ability to do other things like what? Excel in school, right? To feel comfortable in school, to not be considered a problem in school. Yes, sir. So what do you think made the difference in your life? So I'm, I'm going to push back at you. You're saying that you moved 14 or 15 times from Newport, Rhode Island to here, right? I'm just repeating it for people who can't hear you. And um, you didn't turn out like this, right? You didn't have negative social behaviors. You didn't drop out of high school. You didn't have a limited vocabulary. You are wearing a Patriots mask, but OK. Um, tell us, um, who was in your life? After all you've heard today, what typically has made a difference to children who have gone through these risk factors? I, I need this. Oh. I honestly don't know. Like, um, I can't say that my mom was in my life because she wasn't. I can't say that my dad was really in my life because he really wasn't. So, like, I was in and out of homes, um, 
grew up with different people. I honestly don't know. Like, I can't just pinpoint one person that was just like there for me that made me have these decisions. I just, growing up, I just knew I didn't want to get in trouble. I respected adults. And then like, I knew that I needed to learn stuff so I could be smart. And then I was an athlete. So I think sports is really what pushed me because if I didn't have sports, I wouldn't have gotten good grades in school. Okay, so, so thank you for that. So sometimes it is not an adult alone, but maybe a constellation of adults, which I'm getting, you got a lot of, guessing you got a lot of positive reinforcement from sports, which then had a spillover effect into your academic uh, attainment, and that you're just naturally incredibly resilient, and that we could take lessons from you, right? I mean. Sometimes uh, you have to wonder about studies uh, because they are population-based and they may not apply to single people, like I, single examples of people. I, I like to think of all that I used to read when women were being told to stay home and that it was bad for mothers to go to work. I remember reading um, in the late 70s or 80s that latchkey children um, were most likely become delinquent. and. Um, my mother would come home at six o'clock, my father would get home at five, I'd get home at three and wait for them to come home and bring my younger brother home. And from three to five, a lot of things happened, um, including once getting a sucker stuck in my throat, but that's another story. And yet I never became a juvenile delinquent, you know? And so, wow. Uh, and this is also an example, not only of population data, not telling all stories, but an opportunity for someone who's transcended this, like you, sir, to say, yep, there's a way out. Yeah, those are definitely risk factors, but you can transcend. And let me tell you what I did to make that happen. And, and people should use you as an example that it's possible. So, I, and me too. I really want to be um, shown around the country as not a delinquent. But like you, I had others and other interests in my life. And having those other interests, having that goal that you wanna to get to uh, can not only be a source of strain, but it can be a huge protective factor. So the fact that you wanted to excel in sports and you found that way out each time is hugely important. This is why we are always pushing after school programming and competency building and peer leadership Every community should have a multiplicity of those offerings, not just through the school, but beyond, so that young people can find their niche and use that as their lifeline. That can be their protective factor. For me, it was, it was history. Anything having to do with the history of where I grew up, I found fascinating. Um, and that's a bad sign, I guess, uh, about me. But it doesn't matter what it is. If it's dancing, if it's boat building, if it's... Um, uh, I don't know, mountain climbing. It doesn't matter what it is, so long as it is pro-social, not criminal, and you can find that thing that pulls you and that becomes your salvation from other strains. It's that that many kids lack. And again, that's often a perception of perceived options, right? If we are not showing them the world, if we are saying the world is your couch, your television, and your games, that is insufficient for a lot of kids to find their niche like you did. Um, impacts of homelessness are also well known. You are seeing that homelessness affects classroom engagement. This is not rocket science either. Um, if you're hungry and you're not sure where you're going to sleep that night, it's harder to be engaged, right? They're much more pressing issues. And yet we find routinely um, that this becomes a risk factor when teachers are not at all aware of this. Um, is everyone here aware of the McKinney-Vento Act? Because we go to places where homelessness issues are, are really not known, not even the federal law that protects kids in those situations. So uh, this is going to be a heightened issue with COVID, I think, and so many of our our um, housing issues that were already bad, um, just being exacerbated. I understand right now that um, places that had mortgage forgiveness are now ending that forgiveness period. And so there's an expectation of increased foreclosures. In any event, a parent, if you imagine a parent trying to stand upright and getting dented like that car metaphor, um, with all the survival obligations uh, for their children or their family, and a parent who may not really be well-equipped to deal with it. And notice, I haven't talked about opiates. 
I haven't talked about alcoholism. I haven't talked about meth or any other kind of adult drug addiction that is rife around parts of this country and that are also enormous risk factors. Let's just say we have a parent who's doing their best. It's hard for them to be emotionally available. It's hard for them to get the energy to be that cheerleader when they're under so many risk factors themselves. Does this sound familiar to any of you? That when you look at the child, the child is the symptom of a family that's in severe distress? Unfortunately, in our country, we're looking mostly at the symptom, not at the constellation of factors that affect the one kid. So again, we're just gonna keep reiterating what we're saying like a mantra, a safe, stable, nurturing adult is key here. And you're a buffer, you're a model, you're a guidepost, and increasingly we have to understand the systems or as members of system-involved kids that this is our role too, not just necessarily to correct or punish or get kids uh, what they need in education or otherwise, but to be an adult in a country that has lost a lot of its adults in kids' landscapes. So all this is important when you consider who's going into foster care, and foster care is a great predictor of system involvement, um, just as exposure to trauma is a great predictor of system involvement for juvenile justice systems. The vast majority of kids going into foster care are not there because of physical or sexual abuse, but because of neglect. And when I talk about lack of availability, I was talking emotional, but how many of you have had to go into a home and find no food, no bedding, nothing? Police routinely talk about this. Um, and, and our child welfare systems are overwhelmed with demand and under-supported with alternatives to terminating parental um, rights or finding housing situations that could help address the neglect. And so the two times you're gonna see kids going into foster care, anyone wanna guess what are the two ages, age range where you see most kids going into foster care in America? How about you, do you wanna guess? So you're right. Um, under three, and then starting again at 14, because those are the most stressful times to parent a child. You can kind of forget about them from like five to 12, and then, oh my God, they become canes again at 13 and rub your face into your limited parenting skill set. And that's again where you see a lot of, I won't call it safe havens, but drop them off and run like hell. Uh, so this all speaks to the fact that when we have an increased surge in poverty or unemployment or their inadequate opportunities to sustain families, we see uh, what is basically systemic treatment getting filtered down through the family lens into these kinds of ne neglectful treatments. And poverty puts children at a compounding disadvantage. Now, I just want to be heard that even though I'm focusing on poverty, some of these issues are happening to middle-class families right now or families that were wealthy and suddenly are not. You see a lot of those where I'm from in the Northeast where a very high standard of living goes from very high to zip very quickly. Um, but when you have lived in these limited options, when you've had these limited perceptions of what you could do with your life or where you could find your joy and you don't have adults cheerleading you on to find what makes you happy, you start to see cognitive development um, falling behind at a young age, and it's more difficult to catch up. You also see this when the public schools, which are funded by local real estate taxes and reflect the level of community wealth, cannot offer kids all they need. So maybe they're offering school resource officers and not psychologists or early intervention tech, uh, interventionists. And, as you see that, you see the disconnection between kids in a school system that can't respond to where they're at. And so often I see teachers or school administrators, and I, I've seen this even in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I live, where there is this expectation that all the children entering that system, which is 40% socioeconomic um, 
40% lower socioeconomic status in Cambridge. Um, expecting kids to have middle class mores, values, and habits, and they don't. And when they don't, they don't fit the paradigm and they're pushed out. That's a lot of how school feels to many kids. And so you start seeing them falling off the educational connection and avenues to opportunity that way. And so they, they're entering adulthood with fewer of the habits that would enable them to escape their socioeconomic status and, and succeed and get out of it. Which is why right now, I don't know if any of you have heard of this Isabel Wilkerson book, the term cast is returning to the vocabulary of the United States because when you have this array of risk factors, um, it becomes much more difficult to become the one who transcends it and moves up and out uh, like you did, sir. Um, so how do these strains lead to children's involvement in the child welfare and delinquency systems? One way is through child welfare, right? So if you've grown up from zero to three in a household where there's terrific chaos, there's a lot of fighting, there's some mental health issues, and there's drug use, not to mention alcohol use, your placement in the child welfare system, a friend of mine um, sarcastically calls it shoots and ladders, is often your pathway or bridge into the juvenile delinquency system. And simply looking at the kid's behavior, that can make sense, right? Kids who are not living in a well-regulated, predictable, orderly environment are also not going to know how to self-regulate as well. Is that all kids? No. Is it the kids you're most likely to deal with? Yes. So consider Massachusetts again. 55% of the kids in the juvenile delinquency of Mass system of Massachusetts had spent numerous years in the child welfare system. I'm guessing if you explore that here too, you'll see that the least well-raised, the most vulnerable kids end up as a majority of the juvenile delinquency system. So in so many ways, poverty defines many children's life trajectories, and it is, it's sad because it's like a, a heavy hand that snatches hope and kind of increases disappointments and deprivations, and it shapes a life of limitations. Um, when I went to college, I lived in New York City, and I stayed there for 20 years, and I lived on 122nd and Amsterdam Avenue, and I used to hang out with kids on my block, and I'd say, you wanna go over to 125th Street? 122nd and Amsterdam, 125th Street, sure enough, was three blocks away by anybody's math, new or old. Nope, they hadn't been there. Do you wanna go downtown to see Rockefeller Center? Never heard of it, never heard of it. So you see these limitations in perceived options kind of reinforcing the limitations of childhood. And that is a key thing I think we as adults have to do, which is a protective factor, which is widen their horizons. I do want to say uh, that there's really good news. Um, I, for one, come from a family um, that was wealthy on one side and not at all on the other. And uh, poverty was definitely a part of half of my family's life, and poverty is uh, by no means irreversible or necessarily always harmful, right? Poverty can be a great way of learning habits and strength and resilience that your wealthier friends will wish they had when they face difficult times or even when they just can't control themselves. So I want to introduce you to this great Smoky Mountain study. Does anyone know the results of this study? This is really interesting and worth reading. So in the Smoky Mountains, um, that's uh, North Carolina, on the southwest part of that state, a bunch of psychiatrists decided to follow children for 18 years to track their psychiatric symptoms, because I guess they had a lot of psychiatric uh, symptoms. And so they did. And they're looking at these symptoms of children, and they're seeing manic depressive, and they're seeing terrible depression and extreme anxiety disorders. And then for a subset of those um, uh, blue counties there, all the, all the symptoms disappear. And one year, none of the kids from those counties have those. And like, no, we're psychiatrists. You can't just get rid of a psychiatric problem that quickly, or we'd all be broke as psychiatrists. You have to sit on a couch for years before you can get rid of that. 
problem? Well, not for these kids. Um, for these kids, what had happened was they all were part of tribal lands. And on these tribal lands, the casinos had suddenly come into wealth and distributed $7,000 um, of their wealth to families who belonged to the, the tribal lands um, in which those children lived. And the simple addition of $7,000 to each of those families' income was enough to reduce some of the toxic stress, sufficient to reduce the manifestation of a lot of these children's behaviors as presented in schools. So that, that should give us all hope, and you can understand more now why people are talking about how wages matter so much. I mean, it's nothing none of us here wouldn't know. I mean, we all want to get paid more. But why it's so important and why it has this terrific ripple effect for the kids you deal with daily. COVID has also manifested how these factors affect mental health, how they affect parents' availability, and how poverty um, is inescapable. And one of the things about 2020 is there have been a couple of truths now that it's harder for people to deny. So a lot of people don't believe that there are many, many children, millions, about 50 million children on free and reduced lunches in America. In this, the, the, the wealthiest nation in the world. Um, with COVID, and the feeding systems that were disrupted uh, because school was not in session, a lot more people are realizing how many children are living in situations that cannot address the basic Maslowian uh, physiological and safety needs of children. The other thing, though, is you see that the strains on the family are increasing and having this trickle-down effect on families when they don't have supports because they're literally, in this case, isolated. They may not need transportation right now to connect, but they need others. It takes a village, whatever your political persuasion, it's very hard to raise children alone. You need other adults, and that has been made terrifically harder. And so the stresses on the parents always trickle down. I always say nothing trickles down except bad stuff. Um, that, that's just me, although champagne at some weddings. Um, the other thing that's undeniable now is that there are race issues in America, and they are of long-standing reality, and they disproportionately affect people of color, and people who are not of color have extremely different experiences in school, uh, on the internet, and with law enforcement. And if we think this doesn't affect kids, we need to think again. We know they're watching some of these incidents of violence uh, with law enforcement on loops, on social media, and hearing a lot of conversation about it. We also know that it's traumatic for them to see this happening to people who look like they do. So all the studies showing what racial trauma does to kids is confirmed that even if it's not personally experienced, even if it's vicariously experienced, it is still experienced as trauma. And it becomes that shark music, which I personally have when a police officer comes up behind me. But if I was a black woman, maybe that music would be a thousand times louder and would make me prepare for a fight, right, to assert my rights. We know with children that their heightened sensitivity to being threatened or feeling at risk is now even further heightened. And if you um, thought before that they were internalizing negative stereotypes, some of the conversation in the last year in this country has just compounded that and has increased their fear when you have people speaking very frankly about needing to annihilate them or put them in their place. Um, you cannot understand this if you don't understand trauma and the impacts this has on kids' physical and mental health. So those of you who are dealing with truancy, what's the first way you're going to see this if you're working in a school system where you're, represent, you're dealing with children of color who are maybe 10% of the school population? What's the first thing those kids are going to do? What does your kid do when they don't want to go to school? What do they have? 
stomach ache. And then what does that lead to? All right, I'll let them stay home today. And then what does that lead to? And if we don't acknowledge these things, we created that risk factor instead of developing protective factors to address it and help kids figure out what to do. I, I don't know, how many of you have school systems where a kid who's of a minority, which could be racial, ethnic, religious, know what to do if they're harassed? What protective factor have you built in uh, to protecting them when they feel at risk? I want to play this video. This is from an extraordinary truant officer in Cleveland. And um, she's going to talk about some of what you as uh, social workers, truant officers, police officers, judges, folks who go into fa families' homes to work with them through multi-systemic therapy or otherwise may see. But some of the last things I want to leave you with is what she says about the danger of looking at the poor differently. or. Um, there but for the grace of God go I, which would be our chosen approach. How the way we view these factors can make us um, a risk to the kids we're supposed to help. I never thought of in terms of poor, poverty, welfare, stigma, or nothing like that, but at that point, working for the school board as a truant officer, I began to go in and out of people's houses and I would hear their stories and they would say, well, I really would have had my daughter in school today, but she didn't have a coat or my son had to stay home because I'm required to go to work and if I miss her day, they'll stop my check. So I really couldn't send him. He had to stay home and watch the kids. Now poverty is just not that you are cash poor, you're culture poor, you're morally poor, you know, it, it's a moral issue, something must be wrong with you, you are illiterately poor. Something, it, it, it destroys the person it, that, it, that is poor, but I think it also destroys the person who uh, assumes that because they have something that the poor do not, it destroys their character as well. It's a very interesting point of view, right? It destroys our character if we think ourselves better than and it's easy to do that. I can't tell you how many times I'm wondering, why aren't there any books here? Why isn't she more stable as a parent? It's really easy, but I think when we do that, we become a risk factor instead of trying to support up or expect up with uh, other approaches. So when we're thinking about interacting with kids in the trauma world, they say, what happened to you? But let's not even start with that. Let's assume kids are under strain and have stress. And so when they misbehave, let's find out what that behavior was the tip of the iceberg of. What's stressing you out? Um, what are you thinking about? What are you thinking about? Well, you know, if it's something like, um, I don't know where I'm sleeping tonight, that's stressful, right? I don't know how I'd handle that. Um, and do and you need a quiet place? How many of you go into homes and there's no quiet place? They can't do homework, much less think quietly. So outside becomes the uh, place of choice. And all I'm saying is leading to this basic uh, thing that we as adults in kids' landscapes must do, right? We have to be there to touch them and connect to them. And the hardest ones are the most demanding ones um, and often bring us the greatest benefits, not that we can with all kids, but what they want to have answered by us is, will you care about me? And this is just what the commissioner was saying this morning. Uh, will you be there for me in a struggle? And I salute the public defenders here 
who go to court and often are the first time a kid has met with someone who advocates for them. Um, hats off to you for that. That can be a totally novel experience for kids. Not to mention all the others of you who advocate for kids to make sure they get the educational or other supports they need. Uh, do you have my back? All we've heard about today is how trauma makes kids feel like they gotta do this all the time. That's not a normal way of living, and many of us were lucky enough not to live that way. Uh, but what happens if a kid has not been able to live that way? They wanna know someone's there for them, but until they do know that, they're gonna test you. And that is all normative, but it is hard work. And finally, you know, when you look at the suicide rates in America, which now um, are the second leading cause of death, used to be the third, um, and the rate of suicide among children, uh, 10 to 14, has really increased the most. And I, I go to some places in California where um, this one county had so many suicide attempts by eight to 12-year-olds, I'd never seen anything like it. The week I was there, a 16-year-old hung himself in the city's central park area where everyone could see. Um, does it matter? Because a lot of kids are feeling like they don't matter, uh, nobody cares, um, and as a result, they wonder, should I bother? And those kids are the most at risk. Uh, they're also sometimes more dangerous because they feel like they have nothing to lose. And we don't want anyone to feel that way in our communities. And if we can't tell them what's the point because they've lived in such limited circumstances, um, then we're in trouble as a, a culture. I think you're all here because you can answer these questions. Maybe some of your colleagues can't and maybe you need to help them understand that. I see brilliant interventions across this country like a group of San Francisco police officers who bring a group of 30 or 40 kids to Ghana every year with money they raise. I see wonderful examples of social workers taking foster care kids on duck boat rides. Um, I see many efforts to expand kids' perceived options and options of connection to adults. And I think that's really what we must do to support protective factors, not be a risk factor ourselves, and help minimize some of the collateral consequences of risk factors in kids' lives. Thank you. Thank you for the work you do.